Welcome to the Primetime Podcast, everybody, hosted here on the MEG Nikki YouTube channel. My name is Nick, and I hope you guys are doing well whenever you are checking out the latest episode of the show that talks about all things in the world of TV, news reviews, commentaries, and much more. Today is episode number 18 for you guys here, and in our long-standing tradition of looking over the 2021 to 2022 TV network schedule, we are continuing that series of videos here for the podcast with a look at the late winter into the spring of the network lineups here. The first episode was back in episode number one here where we took a look at the fall schedule in episode number 10, which was released a few months ago back in November, we took a look at the winter schedule. Now we are coming up into the spring here. And in those few months since the last time we looked at this lineup here, lots of stuff has changed indeed. We have some new shows that are coming out. We have some returning shows for the spring. We have a bunch of different changes that were previously on the schedule that have now been modified in some way that we're going to go over as well. And I'll give you guys some updates on what shows are currently doing really well. And we're starting to, to take a look ahead at the uh, end of the year season as well, kind of formulating what shows are going to take those top ranks come year end season in May, which will be very exciting. And just kind of ride out the rest of this TV season here and just take a look at all of the great shows on this lineup here. Of course, let me know in the comments what you guys are going to be watching throughout the spring season. I'll, of course, give you my shows as well. And let me know what shows you think are going to top the list come year-end ranks when we get to it uh, in a couple of months here, which will be very exciting. Let's take a look at the Sunday lineup first, as always here. Sunday so far this year has been relatively competitive, I would say, so far. Uh, we've had some big, big shows on Sunday nights. NBC was definitely the front runner early on in the fall and the winter with the coverage of Sunday Night Football, of course, always does very well for them. We had those CBS dramas also pulling in some really big numbers, but for the late winter and into the spring season, we have, it looks like, a new front runner here with ABC, specifically with their latest season of American Idol here. This is the 20th season of American Idol. Obviously a massive, massive juggernaut in the world of TV. And I've been saying this forever, guys. In fact, in the previous podcast we did, we talked about American Idol and its reign early on with Fox, how in 2002 when it launched, it became the single biggest show on TV for six consecutive years there, single-handedly, objectively so, the most popular show in the history of television there. And even 20 years later, this thing is still pulling in numbers that we just do not see nowadays. The first season, or excuse me, the, the first episode of the season, rather, just launched back last week, and already we're seeing it pull in numbers uh, that we have never seen so far this season for the demo. We have a 0.93 for the first episode, which is absolutely phenomenal there. The biggest shows of the season right now, like Young Sheldon, the Chicago shows, um, the FBI shows, stuff like that, uh, that we always talk about as like huge, huge juggernauts right now. Even they are struggling to hit uh, figures like that. So American Idol right now absolutely dominating the competition there uh, for the actual viewership around 6 to 6.5 million, which is absolutely amazing for ABC as well there. And then that gives the rookie there at 10 o'clock a big lead in as well. America's Funniest Home Videos as well holding its own at 7 as well there. So ABC a very, very strong start to this winter and to the spring season here. American Idol we'll see later as well going to be on Monday nights in addition to Sunday, continuing its tradition of the two nights there for the competition and then the results, of course, going back to the Fox days, of course. So ABC, a very, very strong start here. Let's take a look at CBS here. Nothing really too noteworthy uh, that's changed all that much. It's just uh, going back to its fall schedule, right? We have the Equalizer, NCIS LA, and SWAT there. All of those doing just fine for now. They took a little bit of a hiatus for the winter schedule. They had Big Brother in there, of course, which was their winter season uh, sort of event show that competed against the Olympics and the Super Bowl. We're going to talk about the effects of those uh, throughout this podcast as well, because the winter was definitely shook because of those big sporting events and such. 
But now that we're on to late winter into the spring, those three dramas going to ride out the rest of the season. And I think CBS is going to be very, very satisfied with those. Going into the CW here, oh man, the CW, they have had a little bit of a tough time here trying to hold their own on Sundays here. This actually does look a little bit different than how we saw it previously here. We have this new show on Sundays called March here, which premiered back, I think it was towards the end of December into the beginning of January there. And this is a docu-series here. It's about a local high schools and their marching bands uh, that play for, you know, their local sporting events, football games and stuff like that. Um, it sounds like an okay idea, but, you know, the CW just doesn't really have the best luck with that type of uh, series there. They're definitely more, excuse me, more, more known for their uh, dramas and such, their superhero type shows. That's really where a lot of their fan base is, whole, is held right now. So uh, a series like March, not really the best, uh, you know, chemistry there with their fan base, of course. Uh, we do see Riverdale on the schedule still. That is going to stay there. That is a little bit of an interesting move on their part because they normally don't have their premiere dramas on the weekends like that. So we'll have to see how that does come uh, later in the month here, March 20th. That's set to premiere. And then we're not exactly sure what's going to take over in the spring there once March is finished with its run. But the other main show that I wanted to discuss here with the CW was this one here. You see two sentence horror stories. This had a small run at the beginning of winter there. It was on the schedule last time we talked about it. And I had a lot of faith in this show. I figured this was a really, really good match for the CW. It had done really well previously for them. It had a pretty big fan base going back to their early days of streaming with the CW Seed. It was one of their premiere shows there. It's kind of like a Twilight Zone-esque anthology series with a lot of horror elements to it. it. seemed like a really good fit for them. Well, this show, believe it or not, is going to go down in network TV history as one of the most infamous due to the fact that Super Bowl Sunday, just a couple weeks ago, they premiered a rerun of this show, which, you know, obviously most of the network's just going to bow out uh, against the Super Bowl because they know they cannot compete with uh, the sort of events like that and such and the Olympics as well, all on NBC this year. Uh, but Super Bowl Sunday, they premiered a rerun of Two Sentence Horror Stories, and this was the first time in network TV history that any show, rerun or not, regardless of what channel or what, um, you know, what time it was on, premiered to less than 100,000 viewers in its viewership stats. We don't ever see that low. We never, ever have seen that low before when it comes to network TV. Cable TV, occasionally we see that. Streaming TV, we occasionally see that but never on network TV. That is a new low, and the title show to finally break that 100,000 viewer stat there was Two Sentence Horror Stories. So this show is going to go down in history as the single lowest ranked show as far as viewership ever recorded for broadcast TV, and that is something that is you know, noteworthy, but not for the right reasons always, because we like to promote network TV. We like to promote broadcast TV like that. And seeing that stat, man, that kind of broke my heart a little bit, but it's all good. You know, the CW will bounce back from this. They have a plan of attack here with Riverdale coming up. I think they're going to be okay come spring, but it's just very, very interesting to see how low uh, network TV has gotten over the last few years there. Uh, moving on to Fox here, they are just going to double down with all of their animated sitcoms here. The Simpsons, The Great North, Bob's Burgers, and Family Guy, they're doing it just fine right now with those. Uh, all of those have their season renewals in, so they are all good to go here for next year as well. And then NBC here on Sunday definitely has the most uh, kind of the wild card uh, schedule here with these new shows. We're not really sure um, how all of these are going to do. There's some speculation here about a couple of them, but most of them, you know, we, we just don't really know um, how they're going to compete against all of these other big juggernauts like the Fox uh, sitcoms and American Idol that have been on TV for years and years. So looking at the schedule right now, they have just reruns of America's Got Talent Extreme. That's a new show that they premiered in the winter. We're going to talk about in just a minute here. And then starting in March there on the 6th, they're going to premiere The Courtship, which is this new dating show they have. It's essentially like The Bachelor 
Bachelorette, you know, any of those reality dating shows that you might find on TV now. But the whole gimmick with this one is the setting is meant to be sort of like an old time, you know, royalty princes and princess uh, sort of theming to it. And that's obviously going to attract a very specific group of people that are going to enjoy that. If you like, you know, Downton Abbey or a show like that, you know, that old time British royalty sort of vibe to it. Uh, then this is going to be right up your alley. Or if you like those dating shows in general, uh, as you can probably tell from my tone, it's not going to be something that I'm going to be checking out here. But, you know, it has a niche audience, so uh, it can probably find success in that regard. Again, I'm not really sure how well it's going to do up against something like American Idol or The Simpsons or even Riverdale, for that matter. Um, it could be a huge, huge, huge flop for NBC, but we're just not really sure yet. And then a week after that, they're going to premiere The Weakest Link, which is an ongoing show that they've had um, part of their game show lineup um, hosted by Jane Lynch here. It's one of the revivals they have. This is interesting because NBC doesn't really have a lot of shows in this category, unlike ABC, which has really been doubling down and tripling down hard on their game shows as we saw back in the fall. And then they're going to have some more in the summer coming up as well. So NBC not really as um, familiar with this style, not really as um you know, used to promoting these types of shows and such. So how it's going to work with their audience, again, is kind of up in the air right now. We're just not really sure. Um, so we'll have to just wait and see the results on that one. And then the 10 o'clock show is going to be Transplant here, which is going to be one of their premier dramas. This actually started back in 2020. They launched this show, and this is going to be, I believe, its second season. It's already locked in for season three because... This show is not a U.S.-based show. This is not one produced by NBC. They don't have any uh, hands in the funding of this show. This is actually a Canadian show based on their network CTV, I believe it is. It's one of the Canadian networks that produced this one. And during COVID, when all of these networks had to uh, suspend production or they had to shut down certain shows um, because of safety restrictions, they ended up picking up a lot of these international shows. We saw that on the CW. They picked up a few. Um, I think ABC picked up a couple of them. And then NBC picked up a couple of these medical dramas, one of them being at Transplant there, which was the most successful one. And it worked, uh, it did really well on Canadian TV, and it did well here in the U.S. So NBC and their Canadian providers as well just decided that they're going to keep renewing this show. It's getting good numbers, so NBC is going to continue with season two of Transplant there. That'll be interesting to see how it goes up against The Rookie and SWAT as well at that 10 o'clock slot. Um, personally, you know, again, medical drama is not really my thing there, so I wouldn't put too much faith in it, but again, we'll just have to see how that works out for them come March there. So that is the look at the Sunday lineup. Like I said, I think ABC really has this one in the bag there. That first episode of American Idol absolutely blowing everyone away with just how popular it still is after all these years. That is something I've been saying for a long, long time now. Um, even before I started the podcast and started doing my YouTube channel and stuff, American Idol has just been a massive, massive show for decades now. Um, and a lot of people will argue that the quality has dipped and, you know, the revival on ABC isn't as good as it was back in the day. And I agree with all of that, but you can't count out American Idol. It's a diehard fan base there. That's a ride or die show, man, that they will always, always defend there. And we're seeing that right now at the start of the season. So that is going to be a massive, massive win for ABC there. Everyone else, um, they're just holding steady right now. You know, Fox and CBS, they're just doing what they know. I think the CW is going to be fine with Riverdale there. Really, NBC, they're the ones they, they're the ones to prove here with these newer shows, um, these shows that they're not really as used to promoting, like I said, those game shows. So they're really the wild cards here on Sunday uh, in a pretty competitive and pretty solid lineup overall. Um, definitely one to watch out for come March there. All right, so moving on from that, let's take a look at the Monday lineup now. Now, this one as well was definitely an interesting uh, lineup we saw in the winter there. There were some networks and a couple of uh, instances of some shows that were, were paired together that I did not really trust. And I think most of my intuitions ended up proving correct here when the full numbers came out. Let's start with ABC here. Right now, they're finishing up their season of The Bachelor there, and they just came back with The Good Doctor there. You see that show Promise Land in between The Good Doctor and Monday Night Football there. That was their winter premiere. 
Promised Land was on the schedule last time, and we didn't really know much about it. We didn't know what genre it was in or, you know, what the story was about. Turns out it was a soap opera based on a family who migrates from Mexico up to the United States and starts a winery there. That's the whole premise of the show. And if you guys saw my pilot project that I am currently debuting here every Friday on this channel, in part one, I talked about this show and I absolutely hated it. I did not get any sense of enjoyment from it. I thought it was the worst premiere of the 2021 to 2022 schedule so far. Absolutely despised this show. And a lot of people agree with me here because the fan ratings here on sites like IMDb and others were just absolutely awful. There was like no critical um, consensus for the show whatsoever. And then on top of that, the ratings were even worse there. It became the lowest rated show on its premiere date with under a million and a half viewers. And ultimately, ABC decided to pull the plug on this show only four episodes into its run there. That's when you know a show is just bottom of the barrel, not worthy at all, when the network uh, instantly pulls it from the schedule like that. And that's only happened a couple times so far this year, Promised Land being probably the most notable of them, uh, just filling that spot with reruns that were, of course, doing better with some other more popular shows. And then, of course, now coming back with The Good Doctor here, which is holding steady uh, from its fall premiere as well. The Bachelor, uh, not really my thing, of course. Again, those dating shows, not really in uh, the genre that I particularly enjoy. But again, it has a niche audience. It's doing just fine for itself. And then come spring, like I said as well, we're going to see American Idol once again at that 8 o'clock slot for two hours. Uh, again, keeping with that tradition of doing the two nights back to back like that. That's going to be a lead in for The Good Doctor. That's definitely going to raise up The Good Doctor a bit, which is awesome to see. So ABC really turning themsel themselves around here um, come spring. This is when they usually start to figure out what worked from the fall and what didn't and sort of alter themselves to stay strong towards the end of the season. And this is also when networks like NBC or CBS that start the season really well start to hinder themselves a little bit, start to make some decisions that weren't exactly in their best efforts. And we'll talk about that as we go through. Um, but ABC definitely staying really, really strong here. American Idol and The Good Doctor, that's definitely going to be a big, big win for them once again. Going into CBS here again, they're just holding steady with the sitcoms and the NCIS shows there, The Neighborhood, Bob Hart's Abishola, both of those now getting their season renewals already, which is awesome to see. The Neighborhood will do season five next year, and Barbara, Bob Hart's Abishola, I believe, is season four there, so that's awesome to see. I really, really enjoy those two. Then NCIS coming back uh, after its hiatus with Celebrity Big Brother, you see there. Again, NCIS, one of the most popular shows of all time over the past like decade and a half now um i think it's running for like it's 19th season or something like that it's definitely up there with you know your svus your Grey's anatomies your um you know family guys and such uh 15 20 years on tv and it's still going strong which is awesome to see and then you have ncis hawaii as well ncis hawaii there is some speculation there whether or not that one will get the renewal. I think it will, um, personally, if you ask me, because NCIS is a massive, massive franchise, and LA is doing really well, like we said earlier, and then the original is still doing well, and to have those three on the schedule, um, or just, you know, pair them up with uh, CBS on their streaming services and international distribution as well, those are obviously going to be huge factors in determining um uh, renewals and such and, and you know, ordering more episodes. And I think Hawaii is strong enough and steady enough right now that it'll definitely get there. Um, one episode in particular they did uh, after the, um, was it the AMC, AFC championships or the NFC championships? I forget which one, but um, when football season was uh, in the big swing and we were seeing the championship games, a lot of these networks decided to promote some of their newer shows uh, behind football to really give it a boost and such. And NCIS Hawaii was one that they did a couple times with, and that definitely shot up their numbers. So that was a smart move on their part. A lot of people seem to be enjoying it. Even if I don't, again, um, this is another one I talked about in my pilot project video that um, I wasn't really big on, despite um, my enjoyment of some of the other NCIS shows. But again, you know, it's not really my bag whatsoever, but not really a big deal, um, as long as people are enjoying it. Again, huge franchise there, so I think that one's going to do just fine for them. Moving on to The CW, this was one that I was very excited for. 
All-American and All-American Homecoming back-to-back here. Uh, They also put March on the schedule for a little while again, which was just complete filler just to put something in there um, to fill up the winter schedule against the Olympics and such like we talked about earlier. Um, All-American and the 4400, that just didn't really have any synergy with one another. They just didn't really work uh, well next to each other. All-American and the 4400, completely different styles of shows, a sports drama and a sci-fi show, just you know don't really work all that well together, completely different fan bases as well. So pairing the two All-Americans next to each other was a much, much smarter move, and already we're seeing that. These two have great retentions together. Their numbers are really strong. All-American. Uh, I believe already has its next season in place, but I could be wrong on that. Um, the Netflix deals that the original All American has are just through the roof, right? Just absolutely ginormous. And that's awesome to see because that's a show that I've heard excellent things about. Um, for any sports fans out there, definitely want to check out if you haven't done so already there. Uh, but yeah, they're going to hold steady here. I think that's going to be a great uh, sort of schedule for all of you All American fans out there. Next up is going to be Fox here. Now, Fox Monday has definitely been hit and miss, let me tell you, because the 911 shows, whether it's the original or Lone Star, have been absolutely killing it right now. Um, I've stated in the past that those shows are really the only ones, uh, the only major, major dramas that Fox has that are able to compete with like a Dick Wolf show or um, like the NCISs or something like that. I mean, they're putting up numbers that are just absolutely ginormous right now. Um, So those are doing fantastic for them. But the network that, or excuse me, the dramas that they had following those uh, at nine o'clock, The Big Leap and The Cleaning Lady, definitely were a little bit lacking in that regard. The Cleaning Lady is doing better than The Big Leap, and I didn't have a ton of faith in the show, and a lot of people just kind of feel, you know, wishy-washy on it. It's not the best, it's not the worst. Um, I've seen it for myself, you know, it's it's just another run-of-the-mill crime drama. If that's your thing, you'll probably enjoy it. I'm not really big on the crime dramas all that much, so it's not really for me, but... Um, You know, again, it's doing better than The Big Leap, so there's some speculation whether or not that will end up, um, you know, carrying it to a season two, perhaps. But regardless of if The Cleaning Lady does uh, do well or not, it doesn't matter because the two 911s are forming together on the schedule here. They're powering together, and they are just going to dominate here for Fox once again. Um, You have that starting March 21st, which will be very exciting here. Um, And whether or not also... The Cleaning Lady does get a renewal, I think is going to depend on how many episodes it has left on the schedule because it doesn't seem like there's going to be enough room for it to really play out a full season. So unless it can start picking it up uh, in the next couple weeks, it probably is just going to, um, it would just end up as one of those shows that kind of gets left behind this year. So we'll just have to wait and see how that goes. But the 911s again, absolutely going to dominate the schedule here. Very excited for that. And then finally, we end with NBC here. They had a little bit of a messy Monday lineup here when we looked at it for the winter with Keenan, and that's my jam there. They had a show in place for um, the 10 o'clock, which was the end game, of course, which we didn't really know what that was. It has since premiered, and it's just another run-of-the-mill crime drama. That's what people like, apparently. Um, the best way I can describe this show without seen it for myself and I could be wrong so if you've seen it um you know feel free to correct me in the comments but it basically just looks like the blacklist but with a female lead that's pretty much as much as I can tell you there and the blacklist has always been one of those shows that has been steady for NBC but it's never been like a top tier you know you have to check this out you have to um you know catch up with it it's always just had it's very Um, steady, reliable fan base that supports it every year, but it's never been like a massive, massive hit that um, does damage to other networks and such. And the end game is kind of in that same lane. It's doing just fine right now. It's a solid yellow, you know. Um, It could go either way as far as a renewal, but... Um, and then critically, you know, also just kind of in that middle range, just middle of the pack overall, not the worst, not the best. So just kind of depends on if NBC is feeling like they want to take a chance on this one, uh, as far as a season two goes. So we'll just have to wait and see again on that. 
But as far as their uh, premier lineups there, they got Keenan, and that's my jam out of the way. That was just winter filler for the big event show of the season, which originally was supposed to be American Song Contest, but that was pushed back in favor of America's Got Talent Extreme here. America's Got Talent is, without a doubt, the biggest summer show that the, any of these networks have, right? Every single year, that thing comes in at number one reliably for the summer charts. Um, you know, 15, 20 million viewers uh, on average, right? Absolutely dominating the game show lineup there, or the reality show lineup. So making a spinoff to that and putting it in the winter where TV is a little bit less crowded and a little less competitive to get some attention and some uh, you know promotion for the real one that's going to debut in the summer. I thought that was a very, very smart move on their part. People that like AGT seem to really like this one as well. So again, if that's your bag, you know, there's another great show for you to enjoy there. Um, it seems like it's getting good critical reviews as well. So uh, that's a thumbs up for me as far as NBC is concerned. But um, come spring as well, because this is only going to air... AGT Extreme is only going to air for a few weeks here throughout the winter. We have American Song Contest here, which if you don't remember is that, um, you know, essentially Eurovision, but a American adaptation of that. And Eurovision is huge over in Europe each year. It's where all the countries send their best talent and they have this massive festival, this massive competition, and usually get some really, really good uh, new bands and new artists to come out of that. And it's kind of like the American Idol of Europe in that sense. So having this one um, as an American adaptation is going to see from all 50 states, they're going to send their best talent over, and it's going to be a big singing competition there, which should which should be really fun, um, hosted by Snoop Dogg and Kelly Clarkson, I found out the other day, which is going to be pretty interesting. Um, but like I said in the winter podcast episode, I think that this one could be bastardized depending on how they translate it because, again, some of those nuances or some of those little details that make Eurovision so uh, appealing to so many people could be lost in translation depending on how they bridge that gap and such. So we'll just have to wait and see again. Um, depending on how that all kind of formulates and comes together there and uh, how well they're promoting it as well uh, will be a big factor in that because that's going head-to-head -head with American Idol. So that could be a really, really big uh, hit for them or it could be a really, really big flop for them. We'll just have to wait and see. But that is the Monday lineup. Overall, I would again give this to ABC here. ABC and Fox, I think, are definitely the strongest two here. And then the weakest is probably NBC just because they just have a lot of filler right now on their Monday lineup. They just don't really have anything that really stands out or really sticks out at you um, that you have to see. You know, the end game, like I said, just kind of a middle of the road drama there, AGT Extreme. It has its fan base, but it's not really pulling in a lot of new people. So that's just going to be, you know, it, it's reliable, I suppose, but it's not really going to be that enticing for anyone that's not already part of those fan base to go and check it out. Um, so once again, ABC and Fox here, I give the win for the Monday night schedule. All right, next up, let's look at the Tuesday lineup for the spring schedule here. Now, Tuesday has been a bit of a mess overall for almost all the networks. I think they all, except for CBS, is really the only one that's been reliable um, that has had some bumps in the road, man, because all of these networks have changed their lineup a billion times on Tuesday, and they've had specials, and they've had special premieres, and 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 these mini series and such. It has just been a wild, crazy ride to try to keep up with the Tuesday lineup. So let's break it down for you guys. Uh, starting with ABC here. Last we looked at this, we had no idea what the hell was going to happen for their Tuesday. We knew that Albin Abbott Elementary and Blackish were going to stay on the schedule there. They were going to premiere in January. As many of you probably have heard by now, Abbott Elementary is pretty much single handedly saving ABC at this point. Like, this show has been absolutely monolithic, my guy. It has been absolutely ginormous as far as its critical reception, as far as its ratings are concerned. It's the highest rated show currently on IMDb for any of the new premieres with an 8.2, which for a brand new premiere that's only been on for like a couple months now is absolutely huge. Like you do not see numbers like that on IMDb, uh, despite the fact that it's an all black or mostly an all black cast there uh, and IMDb likes it. So 
make of that what you will. But in addition, you also have just an immense amount of praise from other critical sites like Rotten Tomatoes, where it's sitting at a 100% rating, which is massive as well. And then the viewership is absolutely ginormous. I was just reading an article not too long ago saying that this series now is getting higher numbers than Modern Family was during its last couple of years. And Modern Family was an absolute giant, enormous sitcom for ABC. So that is huge. That is absolutely huge for Abbott Elementary. And this is the thing that I really wanted to talk about here because I was very, very confident in this show. You guys know I love sitcoms and I always want to see sitcoms do well here. And in that previous episode where we went over the winter schedule, I said that this was going to be the show that was going to turn things around for ABC. I had huge, huge faith in this show. I put a lot of stock into this one and I am super, super glad that it is paying off for them. That being said, hypothetically, if it does make it to season two, which there's no doubt in my mind it will, but, you know, let's just assume because it's not, uh, you know, uh, set in stone that it will. So let's just, you know, for the sake of argument, say that it is probably their next move here would be put this on the Wednesday lineup, right, alongside the Goldbergs and the Connors, maybe a brand new show as well, and then Abbott Elementary. So those four would be a safe bet for Wednesday. My prediction, if they do that, is Abbott Elementary is the one that they put too much focus on, they put too much pressure on to save their Wednesday lineup, and the quality ends up dipping, the viewership ends up dipping, because it has way too much competition, and because the infamous sophomore slump comes on and rains down on this show. That's not to say that any of that will happen, guaranteed by any means. That is just my theory if that ends up, if they end up choosing to put this on Wednesday. If they're smart, this is what I would do, is keep it on Tuesday. Even if they have to pair it with something that's kind of weird or something that's kind of wacky, we've seen that right now that it's paired with shows that it doesn't really have the best chemistry with anyway, and it's still doing really well. So this thing can stand on its own. It doesn't need the help of the other sitcoms to do it. It can stand on its own on Tuesday. And that's a great spot for it because Tuesday has less competition. Hypothetically, it gets past the sophomore slump and it by season three, you can put it wherever, right? Because if it stays steady throughout season two and season three as well is a huge critical success, then it can stay wherever. But for now, we need to protect the show at all costs. And putting it on Wednesday up against stuff like The Mass Singer and Survivor and um, the Chicago shows is going to be a death sentence, right? Because the only shows right now that is uh, that are doing well for ABC on Wednesday are the Goldbergs, which has been on for the last decade, and the Connors, which is a reboot of Roseanne, which was on for a decade. You know, these new original shows that they've tried to put out, like Home Economics and like The Wonder Years we saw this year, those have been flopping very, very hard because people are just not interested in watching that. And given Abbott Elementary definitely has more critical success behind it than those other shows, to be fair. But even still, it's a very new IP. It doesn't have the legacy of a Goldbergs or a Connors yet. And so ABC, I think, is going to put way too much faith in this show. And I think it's going to cause the writers and the producers to try to implement some stuff into the story that they, like ABC, is going gonna, is gonna to be breathing down their neck trying to you know, put some stuff in that is just not going to flow very nicely. They might try to make it political. They might try to do all these things that ABC is known for doing to try to, um, you know, alter their their success in some way. And I and I would be very disappointed if that happens. So my advice to them, if they want to, you know, for what it's worth, leave it on the Tuesday schedule, even if they have to delay it to winter, because winter is where it's made its name in the first place. It doesn't need to be a fall premiere if it doesn't want to. And let it be a loss leader here and let Wednesday just play out itself the way that it's going to play it out if the Goldbergs and the Connors end up crashing and burning next year because of all the competition, let them. And then just make Tuesday the priority for putting up all their best talent like Abbott Elementary because it's a less crowded day, it's a less competitive day, 
And this show, like we said, can stand on its own, even if it's surrounded by other weird, you know, stuff like this Jeopardy tournament we're going to talk about in just a minute here. I mean, it, it held its own against that. And those are very, very different styles of shows and very different fan bases. So I think personally that ABC needs to take real consideration of this show because like I said this thing is single-handedly steering the ship for them back to the promised land no pun intended and back to the glory days of ABC comedy and if they throw all of that away because they want to try to compete with NBC or CBS on Wednesday next year it's gonna just completely trash their entire reputation and we've already talked about ABC is on the brink of disaster uh, as far as their lineups go. So this show is their one ticket out of that. And if they screw it up, I am going to be so, so furious at them because I love this show and I really want to see this do well. So anyways, rant over, Soapbox is put away. Let's talk about some of the other shows on Tuesday. Now, starting with that Jeopardy tournament, this was a really interesting one because we didn't really know um, about this, you know, on the winter schedule. This was just kind of sprung up on us. Um, this was pretty much just filler as something to compete against the Olympics on NBC, and it did surprisingly well. There were days where this topped the Olympics as far as the ratings are concerned, which is very, very impressive. Um, Jeopardy in general has just been a big kind of topical show ever since um, Alex Trebek passed away and the, sort of the changing of the hosts and all the, the coverage surrounding that. And this was just a very fun, um, you know, sort of simple idea for a primetime tournament just to fill up a few weeks. And people are, you know, happy with this. People that like Jeopardy, they were, it was cool to see um, a, you know, primetime sort of game show like that that's normally reserved for daytime. Um, they liked Mayan Bialik as the host here. They liked the contestants and such. It, it checked all the boxes, you know, if you are a Jeopardy fan there. And um, something that ABC might want to consider uh, bringing back for next winter as well, just making this a yearly series there, uh, just to kind of fill the gap in between the fall and the spring where there really isn't much going on. You know, again, making this a bit of a loss leader there where some of their other premiere shows can do a little bit worse if this can stand taller on a network with, or on a day rather, with less competition, you know? So I think that'd be a very smart move for them. Same thing with Judge Steve Harvey. Judge Steve Harvey, as silly of an idea as this sounds, Steve Harvey hosting a Judge courtroom show actually did really well once again and was helping Abbott Elementary and was helping Blackish and such um, after, you know, premiering after that as well. Um, definitely a sort of show that's only going to hit a niche market, of course. Um, not something that I'm particularly interested in watching, even though I do like Steve Harvey. But this show was able to hold its own against the FBI shows. <laughs> you know, it was able to hold its own against um, The Resident, you know, a, a really critically acclaimed medical drama. So it, it's very surprising because, again, ABC has just had weird sort of bumps in the road with this Tuesday lineup over the past couple of months where they throw something out that, you know, seemingly is just filler or is just going to hit a niche audience. And it ends up doing way better than everyone ex expects. And then... Um, you know, it kind of gives them pause and thinking maybe this is something that we can turn um, into a yearly show or, you know, something we can bring back for the fall. So very, very interesting how that's all sort of played out for them over the last couple of months. Um, starting off the season as rough as they did, they definitely have found um, a couple shows that have turned it around for them, which is very interesting. Uh, and then outside of that, you know, Blackish and to tell the truth coming back. Um, the Queens, I don't think that is going to uh, make it to season two. I think we're pretty much done with that show. So just kind of filling in the gap there at 10 uh, to have something to tell the truth there. Um, one thing that was interesting as well, which is a little more trivial, but it's still kind of worth noting here. Blackish to tell the truth and then the revival of Law and Order, all starring Anthony Anderson. He's in most people's minds, a pretty polarizing guy, like as far as if you like him or hate him. And ABC having two shows featuring him back to back as prominently as those shows do definitely turns some people off of that and then also turns some people off of the um, original Law and Order when that came back. Personally, I love Anthony Anderson. I, he's uh, one of my favorite actors on TV right now. 
but a lot of people are not really that big on him. They just don't really like his style. They don't really like his brand of comedy, which I can understand. He, he's not for everyone. So that kind of hurt ABC stock in a way that, you know, most people weren't expecting. But it was like, we have a lot of Anthony Anderson on the schedule right now, and he's on multiple networks and such. I think he, he might be the only big, big actor like that with multiple shows on the schedule, you know, that are not in any... Um, you know, it's not like the um, Chicago's where they all are kind of in the same universe, right? Like Blackish is totally separate and Law and Order is totally separate. And then he's hosting a game show. Like, yeah, that's a lot to take in, you know, if you're not a fan of him. But um, just kind of interesting to see some of the um, speculation surrounding that. So anyways, that's ABC for you. Um, you know, I think they're going to hold solid for the rest of the year. Um, going into the summer, they usually bounce back really big with those game shows, like I said. So that'll be big for them. And then hopefully, like I said, Abbott Elementary, um, if it does get the renewal, we'll see in the fall what they decide to do with that. If they... If they screw it up, man, that might be the end for ABC Comedy. We'll, we'll have to see because the Goldbergs and the Connors right now, like we were just watching it last night, me and my family, and man, those shows have just gone downhill. You know, I hate to say it because I love the Goldbergs, but that show is is on the brink of just completely destroying its own reputation at this point. Um, so we'll just have to wait and see what they do with that. But that's ABC for you. Moving on to CBS here, they got the FBI's, they're set, ready to go. Nothing's changed there, they are fantastic right now, um, definitely holding their own against all the competition. The CW, you got Superman and Lois and Naomi, these are their top rated shows, so they are doing phenomenal right now. Naomi, despite all of the rhetoric surrounding this show and some of the racist comments, uh, it's doing really well as far as its viewership, so nothing to complain there. I'm really enjoying it myself, even though I'm not a superhero guy. And then Superman and Lois, of course, with Superman as big as the IP of Superman is, I mean, that show is just absolutely tearing through the competition there, so absolutely phenomenal. Uh, Fox. They had a messy, messy Tuesday lineup, let me tell you. Since we last talked about them, they have switched around the schedule more times than I can even remember at this point. So they started off with The Resident and Our Kind of People back in the fall. Our Kind of People had the same trouble that we saw with The Big Leap and such, a new show following a veteran that just didn't have any retention there, just didn't have any holdover. Late fall, they pulled The Resident for a hiatus there, replaced it with reruns of Lone Star, and then continued with Our Kind of People, which seemed weird that they would keep that on the schedule as bad as it was doing. Then Winter, we were supposed to see The Resident come back, and then their new show, Monarch, you might remember this from the previous podcast episode. Monarch was pretty heavily advertised. It was going to be a cross between something like Empire and something like Nashville, right? Empire in the sense that it's a soap opera about a family who has this giant musical empire. They, they own this record label and such, and they're, you know, mega wealthy. And Nashville Elements bringing it in as that it was, as opposed to Empire, which focuses on hip hop, it was going to be country music. They were going to, you know, sort of dominate Nashville in that regard. And that was going to be a very interesting sort of style to bring into the Fox crowd there because um, Empire did really well for them. So it makes sense to kind of imitate that same sort of uh, format and change it up for a different demographic there. Uh, from everything that I saw, people were pretty excited from it, uh, for it. And like I said, it had pretty good advertising. For whatever reason, though, it was pulled from the schedule uh, pretty last minute. It was set to premiere, um, you know, within a couple weeks of them deciding to pull it from it. And instead, it is going to go sometime in fall 2022 is what they say, which in TV speak, that doesn't really mean anything because that's so vague. Um, it could be, you know, on the fall schedule, they could delay it even more. They could decide to cancel it. You never know. Um, as far as the reasoning behind it, some speculation is because of the idea that it was just a really expensive show. And they weren't able to allocate the proper resources for it the way that they were with some of their other shows, which I guess in some ways makes sense considering what they replaced it with, which is The Real Dirty Dancing, which was a last minute sort of replacement there for them that was just complete filler just to put something on the schedule, which is a lowbrow, really cheap to produce uh, dancing competition. It could have had, you know, a decent amount of success if it wasn't so, you know, rushed and, and jammed into the schedule the way that it was. Um, it just didn't really have the best, you know, 
luck as far as the, the marketing and stuff is concerned there. Um, because Fox has done well with dancing competitions in the past with So You Think You Can Dance and such. Um, but this one was just way too forced. And, you know, just all the circumstances surrounding how it got here, um, it just didn't really get the best chance to uh, really, you know, prove itself there. So as far as Monarch is concerned, you know, uh, come 2022, uh, come, you know, fall of this year, we'll see uh, if they decide to go through with it and maybe put it on the fall schedule. Um, that was the other thing that people were speculating was if it's this big, you know, really um, thematic, you know, expensive drama, they might want to reserve it for a fall schedule where it has more of a competitive edge to it rather than just placing it on the winter as kind of a, um, you know, mid-season replacement sort of show, which usually is, you know, not that successful by comparison. So, you know, whatever sort of reasonings you want to attribute to it, for whatever reason they decided to pull it, put in the real dirty dancing there. And that ultimately was a big flop for them. They had to just, you know, do reruns of various stuff for a little while. And then come later in the month here, we're going to see the return of Name That Tune, which is part of their music game show sort of lineup. The Mass Singer, Alter Ego, I Can See Your Voice. Those are all, you know, part of that same group. They're all produced by the same company, have, you know, sort of the same judges and hosts that kind of ro rotate throughout those shows. So those are doing fine for them. Um, following the resonant, not the best combination, I would say, but, you know, it's it's whatever at this point. They, they're just kind of scraping by on their Tuesday lineup because they don't really have too, m too many other options, like I said. So just um, looking at that chart, it's just very messy, you know, seeing all the gray in there as the reruns and such. Just not really the most appealing chart uh, for Fox there, but, you know, they're doing what they can. In comparison, uh, I would say even a little bit better than what NBC has going on right now because they are another one that's had a little bit of a mess on their Tuesday lineup. Uh, winter, as it is currently, they are doing American Auto and Grand Crew at 8, followed by This Is Us and New Amsterdam, of course. Um, in, in the next week or so, we're going to see that transition to Young Rock, Mr. Mayor, This Is Us, and then the thing about Pam. Now, as far as those sitcoms go... Um, American Auto and Grand Crew, I talked about this last time, those shows were just, you know, placed there with no intention, with no real juice behind them. They didn't have the best marketing. They, they just felt very, you know, a filler, you know, is the best way I can describe it. Um, which is sad because I am really enjoying American Auto. That's a show that I didn't really have a lot of faith in I didn't put a lot of stock into and I ended up really liking it and it's becoming one of my favorites for the year uh Grand Crew on the other hand I've talked about that show endlessly at this point um I'm not a fan of it at all I just don't like the um the fact that it, it retreads all those other sitcoms like How I Met Your Mother and Friends and Will and Grace and any other show you know that just has a group of friends living in a big city dealing with their relationships right I've I've use that same exact line on this show probably a million times by now so i'm just so sick of talking about it but um those are going to be replaced here now young rock and mr mayor are two shows from last year that i don't think are bad per se i saw bits and pieces of both of these but i don't think they were strong enough to get renewed honestly i the the nbc sitcom lineup is another one that they're really struggling with their comedies right now um and part of that is because they just don't have any legacy shows anymore. They don't have a Goldbergs. They don't have a, a Family Guy. They don't have a, um, you know, Young Sheldon or something. They All of their shows are brand new. The, the oldest ones they have are from last year. You know, they don't have a, a four, five, six, seven, eight, you know, 20 season long show that is a reliable tentpole for them at this point. So they got to just, you know, scramble together what they can. And these shows ultimately are just not going to be that successful. We saw that earlier with Keenan. Keenan was just a total mess this year. Um, definitely not going to make it to season three by any means. That, that thing is getting canceled uh, quicker than, than most sitcoms this year. But um, yeah, as far as Young Rock and Mr. Mayor, like, Again, they have their niche audiences. I guess we'll see. Maybe they can bounce back with some decent advertising, but I haven't seen much of it yet. So um, I don't know. It's just kind of disappointing because NBC, you know, I think is easily one of the best as far as their comedy. Like they're the legacy of all the comedies they have. They hold the best too for most people in the form of Seinfeld and Friends. Like it's just sad to see how how far down 
you know, quality. They, they've they dipped in the past couple of, of years, you know. They just don't have anything that's refreshing or new anymore. So very disappointing there. But, you know, ultimately, you know, what can you do there? So that's, um, that's going to be their comedy lineup. This is us. It's the final season. It's doing just fine right now. And then, mm, excuse me, the thing about Pam. Let's talk about this show for a minute. Um, based on the marketing alone, this thing is going to do numbers. <laughs> I mean, this thing, if this thing doesn't pull like 6 million viewership and like a 1.1 demo, I would be surprised because the way that people are talking about this show, like this thing is going to be absolutely ginormous. Like I watch a lot of NBC, probably more than most people, but like almost every commercial break, like regardless of what show it is, they are putting promos out for this show and a lot of different ones too. And they keep hyping up the fact that Renee Zellweger is the lead here. People are super stoked about that because she's more known for her movies. She's never really done a show before. Um, and as far as her movies are concerned, like she's usually doing like Oscar bait, you know, Oscar worthy performances and stuff. She's won two uh, Oscars in the past. So she's a super talented actress. And that's getting a lot of buzz just on terms of like, what was it about this particular show or what was it about this particular script that she signed on for that was so revolutionary that they could get this two time Oscar winner uh, to do a TV show like this, you know, on NBC of all things, right? So that's what a lot of people are really wondering here. I think it will depend on reviews. I mean, the first episode will probably do huge numbers. And then depending on if um, the critical reception is good, then that'll sustain it, of course. But um, yeah, based on the marketing, like this thing, it, it's going to do huge, huge figures. If it doesn't, I would be very surprised. And I think NBC would be very disappointed because it seems like they put a lot of stock into this show and they funneled a lot of money into this one. So definitely have to see how that goes. I'll probably check it out at some point just to see. But um, but yeah, that's the thing about Pam. And then uh, New Amsterdam to round out the schedule there. That one is going to do just fine. It already has its season five renewal. It's it's going to enter syndication next year. So they're just, um, you know, kind of dragging it out till it gets there, um, which is totally fine. So like I said, Tuesday here, this has been a mess overall. Like some networks, they have done OK and some networks they have done very, very bad. So it, it's just very, very complicated at this point. I would say going forward, CBS is going to do great. The CW is doing just fine. ABC hopefully can sustain it out with Abbott. We'll see. And then as far as the worst on the schedule, probably going to be Fox here. Um, name that tune and, and the resonant. Just all of the shows preceding that on Tuesday has just been such a clusterfuck that they they really don't have any chance to really scrape anything by at this point. It's just very disappointing to see. But, you know, again, it's TV for you. You know, what are you going to do? But Anyways, that's the Tuesday lineup there. Let's move on to the Wednesday lineup here. Now, this one was a little bit more consistent in that regard. Um, definitely had a little bit more, um, you know, focus in on what shows were going to work here and what shows were going to do well. And I think for the most part, most of the networks did pretty well this year on Wednesday. Um, of course, with the glaring, glaring exception of ABC, which is yet again tripling down this time on all of these sitcoms here the goldbergs wonder years connors and home economics the chase was the new show um that we saw last time that was their return uh, of their game shows and such for the wednesday lineup i guess it was just more of a hiatus to get through winter again to compete against maybe the olympics and such um but a million little things that was their premiere drama came back um just a couple of weeks ago and you know did well enough for what it is but again um, it's not doing amazing compared to all the other dramas at 10, uh, like we'll talk about in a minute. But A Million Little Things is one of those shows that if it does end up getting a renewal, it's purely based on syndication. It, it's purely based on it because it's season four right now. A lot of people say it might have like a half season or might have a limited episode run next year just to hit the quota of what it needs for syndication, which would be 100 episodes. And so they wouldn't need to produce a full 24 episode season to get there. They'd only have to do like 10, you know, or 12 to get there. Even if that's the case, though, this is the kind of show that like if syndication is its goal, it doesn't really do well. You know, the best dramas specifically 
that do best in syndication are episodic police procedurals, episodic medical shows, and just generally, you know, very simple, very um, easy to understand types of episodic style content, right? Uh, regardless of, of what genre it is. But for drama specifically, it's it's really police procedurals and, and medical shows are like the top two that you see most often. And A Million Little Things is this very drawn out, very heavily um, story based drama with a lot of subplots and a lot of things to follow. And it just doesn't have that sort of not really, you know, I, I don't even know really how to describe it. it. Just doesn't really fit, you know, for for syndication as much as some of the other ones do. And that's a problem because if that's what ABC's ultimate goal is here, I think they're going to be disappointed as far as some of the the figures that they could attest here because it's just not going to have that same that same arc as as something like The Rookie. You know, I I would be more inclined to think that they are going to try to push that towards syndication rather than a million little things, but you know, what do I know? Um, I've gotten stuff wrong in the past, you know, I'm not perfect, but I just feel like that's, it, it's just a waste, you know, ABC should be funneling their resources into something a little bit more uh, reliable, you know, or, or a little just more exciting because it just doesn't have the numbers behind it to warrant um, so much attention, you know, that's really my problem with it. And then the same thing can apply to some of these um, sitcoms here. At this point, I think it's safe to say that of the four, the one that has the best chance of renewal is The Connors. The Connors has been very strong this year. Um, when it premiered, we saw way back uh, in one of the previous episodes that that did better than um, The Goldbergs on its first on its uh, uh, season premiere this year. And like, yeah, for a reason, because people are kind of over the Goldbergs at this point. Like I said, it, I mean, it's been on for nearly a decade now. Um the controversies with Jeff Garland and and uh, the sudden passing of George Segal earlier in the season, like those two blows, you know, back to back like that just hit the show so hard. Um, they've introduced a lot of characters that just feel out of place and just feel forced to make the show work now. Like it's time to wrap it up, man. It is so time to wrap this bitch up because um, we it's it's in syndication, right? It can live on in syndication and on streaming and it'll do just fine there. It's a great show. You know, I'd encourage you to check it out. But man, ABC is just dragging this thing through the mud. And as a fan, like, no, it, it needs to stop, man. They need to they need to just cut it. They need to just cut their losses here because this thing is just at this point, it's unsalvageable, you know, given all the controversies and such, which is so disappointing. But, you know, that's ABC for you. They, they don't know when to let things go. They really don't. So of these four, the Connors has the best chance. The Goldbergs hypothetically should have been over by now, but it probably will get another renewal. The Wonder Years is the one that's very much in the yellow right now. Home Economics is pretty much a guarantee that it'll go because it, you know, it's two seasons in and it's still not pulling in the the right stats that ABC's happy with. It, it's time to leave, you know. The Wonder Years, though, might just barely slip by if they need something to fill up the schedule. Because, like I said, hypothetically, their move would be to cut both of those and then keep the Connors, Goldbergs, move Abbott onto Wednesday and then put in a new show. And that would be their lineup of four. But if they decide to keep the Wonder Years, then hypothetically, we might see Abbott on Tuesday still, and that would be a better move for them. So it actually would be a stronger move, um, realistically, to keep the Wonder Years here and just have Wednesday as a loss leader and then just have Abbott on Tuesday, like I said. But, you know, knowing ABC, they're, they're not going to let that go. So we'll see what happens. I don't know what potential new shows they could have, but... Hopefully no more reboots, no more reboots, because uh, the Wonder Years pretty much solidified that the ABC fan uh, fandom just doesn't doesn't care for reboots all that much. So let's move on here to CBS. Um, they've been playing out their um, Big Brother 
uh, once again on Wednesdays here as well, that multiple night sort of season they had against the Olympics like we've been talking about, and then they had the Amazing Race we talked about. Um, Good Sam was one of those shows that they brought in as a mid-season replacement for the winter there, and at the time when we talked about this last uh, podcast, I was super excited for this show. I was super, super excited for the show. I love Sophia Bush. Jason Isaacs is great. Um, you know, it is a medical show, but I figured the talent behind it, like, there's no way they could screw this up, right? Even if it was something that I wasn't going to watch as opposed to Chicago PD, right? I could watch it on streaming later. I could still enjoy it there. I watched that first episode live because Chicago PD was a rerun at the time, and I was totally disappointed with this show. I was completely disappointed with this show. It had absolutely nothing for me to bite my teeth into. It just, it was so bland. It was so cliche that there was just nothing original or unique about it whatsoever. And both Jason Isaacs and Sophia Bush, uh, his performance just felt completely flat, you know, no life, no life at all in this show. Um, so I would not be upset at all if they cut this thing because the, here's the thing with Wednesday going forward all of these networks are going to have an insanely tough time competing with the Chicago's. Like, there, there's just no way around that, you know? And I know what a lot of people are going to say is, like, you're a Chicago fanboy, <laughs> you know, you're a Dick Wolf fanboy. Like, I am. You know, I, I'm going to be totally honest with you. The Chicago's deserve all of their success and all of their attention because they're phenomenal right now. But it's not just me saying that. Look at the stats. There are no shows on Wednesday that can compete with them. There are just no shows at all that that can compete with them. And they've been moving up that ladder. They've been climbing up that Nielsen rank ladder. They're easily going to rank in the top 10 this year. I have no doubt in my mind. Chicago PD in particular has been putting out some of its best material in the last year with episodes in the nines, with some episodes with performances that people are speculating have Emmy-worthy performances in that we might see noms for coming up next year. I mean, there is just so much buzz with these shows right now, and it is super deserved and it's super justified. And every single other network is furious because they have nothing that can compete. They have to pull all of these, you know, bullshit sort of specials they have to tinker with their schedules in order to make some of these shows stand out i mean good sam they literally pulled a former chicago pd cast member to go head to head with her former show and lost miserably (laughs) you know cbs just absolutely egg on their face with that i mean come on uh csi vegas the original uh head to head competitor earlier in the year they were super confident in this show too and i was confident in this show and It's good for what it is. It's definitely a solid CSI show, but CSI, man, it's been played out. People want something new and original in the Chicago's. I mean, they've been around for a while, but not like CSI. You know, CSI has been around since 2000, right? It's time to wrap it up a little bit. And they had to cover the fact that this show wasn't really that good. It did get renewed for season two solely because of international distribution. That was the only reason. Because the domestic numbers, they fucking sucked. Guys, they fucking sucked against the Chicago's. And they know it. And CBS knows it. So, and then, um, so we'll talk, I guess we'll talk about CBS uh, going forward here. And then they have their Survivor shows, which Survivor is huge, but it's not competing against Chicago Med that way. It's just a completely different, uh, you know, fan base, right? It, it's just completely different. And we saw earlier in the year, the Chicago's when, or excuse me, the uh, Survivors rather, when they premiered this year, they had some of the lowest IMDb numbers I've ever seen. Like they were in the threes, dude. And like, what the heck is that about? Like Survivor, I mean, I'm not a fan of it at all, but Survivor has a cult fan base, dude. And like, if they're not happy, if you're seeing numbers in the threes on IMDb, I mean, that's a problem, you know? So they had to replace that. They had to put in the prices right they had to put some filler in the prices right in there to compete against it. And even then, the price is right. The fucking median age for someone who watches that shit is like 75. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry. It's just not hitting the demos, right? It may have gotten decent viewership, but it's not hitting the demos. The Amazing Race was a little bit of a flop this year as well. It took a hiatus from COVID. It just wasn't able to compete. 
And then coming up on the spring schedule, they have this new show called Beyond the Edge, which just looks like a Bear Grylls sort of knockoff type of show. This is just not going to do anything. You know, I'm sorry. I, I watched the trailer the other day. This thing is no way going to be able to compete with fire. <laughs> There's just no way in hell. So I'm sorry. And I, and I don't want to be that guy. I really don't want to be that guy because I like CBS and I like Fox and I like ABC. But I mean, it just the fact that they cannot accept, they just cannot accept for the life of them that they lost <laughs> is just crazy to me. Yeah, it, it's ridiculous to me. Um, the CW here, really no contest. The Legends of Tomorrow and Batwoman just are kind of whatever. The Flash and Kung Fu are coming back. I, I don't care. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just don't care. Um, and then Fox, let's talk about them for a minute. They're coming back with The Mass Singer, which again is part of their singing competition lineup. And The Mass Singer does well. You know, The Mass Singer is extremely popular, so I'll give them credit there. That is definitely a show that can rival the Chicago's, at least to some degree, but it's not getting it uh, critically by any means. I mean, checking again those IMDb scores, The Mass Singer is nowhere near the level of a Chicago Med or a Chicago Fire. Um, but then the show that they have immediately after that that's going to be replacing Next Level Chef is Domino Masters. What the fuck is this shit? Um, do you guys remember that show Lego Masters that they premiered a couple years ago with Will Arnett? Well, this is that, but with dominoes. It's people just making dominoes, just playing with dominoes for an hour. That's all this fucking show is. Fox thinks that dominoes are going to compete with Chicago Fire. I'm sorry, dude. They're just not. They're just not going to do that, you know? Um, speaking of Next Level Chef, by the way, because this is a show that I've been very invested in. I love this show, and it is renewed for season two, which is awesome. But God damn it, the fucking release with Next Level Chef was a, a total shit show. This thing was a total shit show because the way that they had to market this show was, again, like we talked about earlier with um, a lot of channels doing this, putting the premieres or putting big episodes behind the uh, AFC championship games or the NFC championship games or whatever they were um, broadcasting at the time. And Next Level Chef was one of those shows that they did it a couple times. So obviously they were getting huge demo numbers and they were getting huge viewership stats because they were following, um, you know, football games that like millions and millions of people are going to watch, you know, 25 million people are going to watch the AFC championship game. And then, you know, maybe five or six million are going to stick around for next level chef. Right. So then I'm seeing in the promos for the show, they're boasting about the viewership stats. They're saying it's the number one new show in the demo. It's the number one new show uh, in the reality competition genre. And it's like, yeah, because you manufactured it that way. <laughs> because when you just look at the numbers for a basic ass everyday episode of this show on its proper time and place on Wednesday nights, it's getting destroyed. It's getting a third of what it's getting normally. It, it, it gets less than 2 million viewers, you know, when it goes up against Chicago Fire and the Amazing Race and the Connors, right? Like, this thing is is pathetic, you know, and that sucks because I love this show. I'm glad it's getting another season, and it has a cult fan base, myself included, but there's no way that Fox can honestly believe what they're saying with that. When they boast about those, about those stats in the promos, it's manufactured because you put a couple episodes behind championship football games, you know? Chicago's didn't have to do that. They didn't have to do that. They're getting that naturally, you know? It's just, I'm sorry. I, I don't want to come off cynical. You know, I don't want to come off like a like arrogant at all. I have been studying this for a very, very long time now, well before the podcasts, you know, well before my YouTube channel. And I've been a huge fan of anything Dick Wolf or the Chicago's for a very long time now. And it's just crazy to me that all of these other networks have the just they, they don't have any sort of respect or they, they don't have any sort of uh, uh, humbleness, you know, or humility on themselves to accept the fact that they can't compete, you know, and they're trying their damnedest with every tactic in the book and they're still failing, <laughs> you know, and, and it's just crazy to me because I'm not saying NBC is like all the time the best because I am very critical of them. We just talked about it earlier in this episode, 
but they do know these shows very well, and they have stuck with these shows for a very long time now, and they know how to properly make these shows interesting even after 10 years. You know, Chicago Fire next season is going to be its 12th season on TV. That's crazy, right? It's been on for since 2012. It's been on for a decade. And then you have all these spinoffs and such that are doing remarkably even better now. Chicago Med, this was the first time where Chicago Med overtook Fire to be the most popular of the three. And like I said, Chicago PD, we're seeing buzzes about Emmy nominations, perhaps, and these amazing performances they're putting out and crazy IMDb numbers. I mean, there's just no competition here. There is just no competition whatsoever. And it's one of those very, very rare cases where a show is just continuously climbing the ladder of how big their numbers are. Actually, let me pull this up for you just to give you an example of what that looks like. Because, you know, you see here in the rank, when you look at these numbers, most of the time they get continuously worse or they, you know, sometimes they stay steady. But the Chicago's are one of the very few shows like ever on TV where you're seeing significantly better and better and better numbers year after year after year after year. Look at this, right? 51 to 31 up into the 20s and now solid in the top 10 for the last three years. You see the viewership, right? Started around 7 million easily in the double digits now for the past few years, right? Let's take a look at Chicago PD as well as another example here. In the 50s, climbing its way up, 36, 24, 18. Now it's about to break into the 10 million mark again. Came off around 6 million, is now, again, solid in those double-digit numbers there. And again, I'm not trying to harp on this because I believe, you know, that I'm right about, like, I again, I don't want to sound arrogant here, but it's important to note because when we talk about these and it's like, obviously, you know, obviously NBC is going to win. I think people are underestimating why that is the case. You know, they're, they're just not looking at the numbers properly. They're, they're not getting their information from clear sources. And it's all there. It's very easy to find all of that info when you want to. And so Wednesday nights going forward, especially next year in the fall, all of these networks are going to have an uphill battle. Every single one of them is going to have an uphill battle. And there is just no way that they can compete with these. They have to accept the fact that Wednesday is going to be just absolutely decimated by NBC. There, there is just no way around that, my friends. So anyways, rant over. <laughs> Let's continue here. Let's go on to Thursday. I know that this is becoming a little bit of a shit show in and itself. But, um, you know, that's why we do these podcasts, right? I just like to let loose here. I just like to... You know, state my piece, you know, and, and give you guys the information that you deserve. You know, I, I want you guys to be just as informed as I am. So I'm showing you the numbers here. I'm, I'm giving you all of these uh, stats and stuff because I want you guys to understand what I mean when I say these things with as much validity and, and, and passion as I do because I know them, you know, I know these numbers inside and out and I want you guys to know them too. So anyways, let's continue on with Thursday here. Now, Thursday is an interesting one because we talked about previously how ABC is continuously steering the ship back in the right direction. They've had some big successes now with American Idol, Abbott Elementary. Thursday, following the Olympics, when Station 19 and Grey's Anatomy and Big Sky came back, it was able to just eke out the law and orders here. And see, this is what I'm saying when I say that NBC is not perfect. And I can accept the fact that the Law & Orders maybe aren't as popular as I would have thought for this season. I mean, they were initially, they easily creamed over them, but something happened over the past couple of months with NBC. They had plenty of time to promote them during the Olympics and during uh, the Super Bowl. Maybe they didn't do it closely enough. Maybe ABC stepped in and they really were heavily promoting the fact that Station 19 and Grey's Anatomy were coming back. From what I could gather, Station 19, their lead-in show, um, ended its hiatus with a cliffhanger and then came back. So that was obviously going to get people's attention. And they pulled out some huge numbers, guys. They pulled out some massive numbers for these. And I have a lot of respect for ABC for doing that. Because, again, these shows are, in, in, like, you know, instant legacies, right? Uh, you have Grey's Anatomy that's been on since 2005. Station 19, the spinoff of it. They're doing phenomenal right now. 
Big Sky, on the other hand, Big Sky is still the one that they just can't make work, which is so disappointing because it was huge last time. Big Sky, they completely fucked over this show by moving it to the wrong schedule and pairing it with the wrong shows. And this is the poster child for what ABC does continuously with potential shows that have a massive first season that they just completely dig into the ground, they put too much faith in it, and then they get absolutely decimated by the competition there because between the three law and orders, organized crime is actually doing really well comparably to the rest of its competition in its direct time slot and is easily decimating over Big Sky there, doubling the numbers that Big Sky gets without question. And organized crime also just personally is my favorite show on TV right now. The storyline in this show is absolutely phenomenal. Dylan McDermott is absolutely phenomenal. Christopher Maloney is absolutely phenomenal. I could go on and on about this show. It's actually coming back tonight with a new episode, which I am definitely, definitely watching, no question. So anyways, Big Sky here, that's the only one that they can't make work on this Thursday lineup, which is very disappointing because it should have been, you know, huge. Um, Women of the Movement and Let the World See, that was just um, kind of their winter filler. Women of the Movement um, is a really good show. It was a mini series they did, historical drama, definitely an interesting one, but um, because it's a mini series, because it was only supposed to produce a few episodes throughout the season anyway, it doesn't really have the same sort of status as the rest of these, so not really too important to discuss here. For CBS here, they're sticking with their comedies, Young Sheldon, United States of Al, Ghost and Be Positive, and then Bull. Now, Bull is an interesting one here, and this is something that I, in the, you know, a very long, very long time. I, I don't even know how long. I've been looking at TV numbers and some and such for. I have never seen a community more divided on this. Half the people think that Bigs or excuse me, that Bull rather was destined to have its final season this year. Was destined to end, you know, on its own terms this year. And the other half believe that CBS put that into place as a cover up because of how bad this show was doing, and they ultimately canceled it, quote-unquote canceled it, because of low ratings and such, and because competition from organized crime, without properly giving the press releases and, and the announcement that it had its final season already in place. So you have this totally divided community one thinking that CBS covered up the fact that they had to announce after the fact that it was a final season to make it look better than, in actuality, the numbers that they were pulling in. And then the other half saying they were saying that from the start, and you guys weren't paying attention, right? Which is so confusing <laughs> because I never heard any announcement from it. Spoiler TV I, they they didn't have an announcement for it. They labeled this show as canceled. They are taking a firm stance that there was never an announcement that said this was the final season, and CBS was embarrassed by the low ratings that they pulled it prematurely, and then after that happened, they announced that it was the final season to make it look better, which that's the side I believe because Spoiler TV has been very, very good as far as, you know, very, very reputable as far as the source goes. So that's a very confusing one. And like, I don't know, I, Bull was, you know, a good show and it had a lot riding on it, I guess. But like, yeah, it, it could have got gone out on its own terms. I, I talked about that previously. I said this is probably going to be the last season regardless. So it's just kind of weird um, how all of that went down, you know, and and how all of um that sort of came out after the end, like people were just so divided on it and just so, you know, just, just having streaming matches and such over this fucking trivial ass show about Dr. Phil. Like, come on guys, we, uh, we do not need any more fucking civil wars about this shit, you know? So anyways, just kind of weird. Um, as far as the rest of their lineup goes, I personally think that the front runner here without a doubt is Ghost. Like Ghost is 
absolutely fantastic. I am loving this show. This is another one that I have checked out here. One of my favorite comedies of the year. Um, that's definitely going season two. And that was a massive surprise because this is how you do an adaptation. This is how you do a remake. Like, this is what Call Me Cat wants to be. <laughs> Call Me Cat is an exact word-for-word -word remake of Miranda. This is an exact word-for-word shot-for-shot remake of the original Ghost, which is a BBC show. And people are going to moan and groan about that. Guys, this show is phenomenal. <laughs> this show is fantastic, dude. This is one of the funniest, most creative shows I've seen, like, ever. Like, that I've ever seen in my entire life. Not even exaggerating. And it's a word-for-word, shot-for-shot remake. I've given my piece on that subject before. I have a whole podcast dedicated to it. I am in favor of remakes and reboots because when they hit, man, they fucking hit. They fucking hit so much. When they don't hit, i.e. the Wonder Years, oh boy, do they fucking dig their own grave, let me tell you. But in this case, it worked out for them, and this show is fantastic my friend this is easily one of the best cbs comedies we've gotten in a very long time because everything else on the schedule including their upcoming show how we roll look pretty bad you know um there's a pretty big fan base out there for young sheldon still there's a pretty big fan base for be positive that's another chuck lorry show but um how we roll this looks like filler this is filler <laughs> there's just no way around this this is getting cut by the end of the year no question like, the trailer for this show, it's about this guy who um, is really obsessed with bowling, so he's going to bowl for his family or something. I, I don't even care about this fucking show enough to even give it a chance. And, like, that's the thing, right? Because this is a dumb network laugh track sitcom, and I like dumb network laugh track sitcoms, but this is just one that I'm like, nah, nah, CBS, do better. You're way better than this. Find another British show to remake word for word because this is not it, my friend. So, anyways, that's CBS for them. They're going to do just fine. You know, the sitcom niche that they fill is absolutely awesome. So, they're going to do uh, just fine here for Thursdays. CW is coming back with Walker and Legacies. They're just holding strong. Walker, I got to tell you, I did not put a lot of stock in this show. This is their third most popular show after... um. Superman and Lois and Naomi right now. And this show is one of the few that can put them over a million viewers per episode, like, easily, which is huge for the CW. People love their remakes, man. People love their remakes, even if it's for cheesy 90s shit, like Walker, Texas Ranger, man. They fucking love their remakes. And Legacies has a cult fan base, so I think they're going to do just fine here. Um, Fox, oh boy. <sighs> Let's get into it. Fox, man, oh man, this is... Is a, this is a botch schedule. This is a fucking botch schedule. This has to be the, as far as like the, the drop in popularity from a fall to a winter lineup or, you know, from one season to the next, this has to be the single worst drop I've ever seen, you know, covering TV. Like going from Thursday Night Football, which was pulling in millions and millions of people, you know, 10, 15 million a game, right? down to the remake of Joe Millionaire, Call Me Cat, and Pivoting, which Joe Millionaire, on its first run, uh, way back in the day, was getting like 30 million people an episode. So I'm not surprised they tried to remake it, but it's been 30 years, and there were better dating shows out there. And this thing, the numbers that it was pulling in, proved that exact statement. This thing was getting like what, 1.75 million, not even 2 million, you know? Call Me Cat was doing really well originally when it was on Sundays, when it was premiering after football again, and then they moved it to their normal night on Thursdays, and it completely sank. Again, I don't know what strategy they're thinking with this, with, um, you know, like we, we've been talking about, um, the strategy of putting a couple of uh, the episodes behind the AFC Championship games and such, and then trying to promote them on their regular night. Like, no one cares. No one cares, especially as bad for a show as Call Me Cat is. Like, nobody is going to watch this. And then Pivoting, holy shit, dude. Pivoting. Um, I talked about this one in my pilot project. If you want to check that out, this show is fucking horrible, man. And, like, Fox didn't even have faith in this show because they paired it with Call Me Cat, dude. 
Like, no, 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 no. They do not have any stock in the show. This thing isn't even hitting a million viewers. This thing is literally CW numbers, guys. This thing is pulling in like 700,000 viewers, if even that, 800,000 maybe, and like a .2 in the demo. Like literally, there are multiple CW shows that are doing better than this. I've never seen uh, a brand new, you know, fall premiere, well, winter premiere given, but um, you know, a, a, a Fox premiere show like this on like a big, big major network like, do this bad so quickly. <laughs> like, it's absolutely ridiculous, you know? And then again, coming from Thursday Night Football, like, holy shit, that schedule is just absolutely awful. So, come March 17th, we are replacing all of that garbage with MasterChef Juniors coming back, which will be exciting. Um, I'll probably check it out. I, I do like MasterChef Junior. I do love the original MasterChef uh, slightly more, but I do like the Junior version as well. Um, so that'll be fun, and that'll probably pull in some decent numbers for them. Of course, Gordon Ramsay always has his fan base in check. We're sticking with Call Me Cat. I don't know why. I I would not be. Um, I I wouldn't be happy with that if I was a Fox exec. But you know, whatever. I guess uh, Mayim Bialik is doing something behind the scenes. We don't know, but yeah, <laughs> you know, um, take that for what is worth. And then we have this new show here, Welcome to Flash, which. I sent this in the group chat that I have with my close friends, um, Mike, Matt, and Steph, and we all agree that this show looks like complete ass, <laughs> despite the fact that Sean William Scott is starring in the show. He hasn't been in the public eye for 15 years now, 20 years at this point. I mean, he was a massive actor back in the day. He was in the Final Destination movies. He was in the American Pie movies. Like, he's one of my favorites, personally, from the 2000s. Um, and this was a big return to TV, or, you know, return to the, the public eye, I guess. And, um, man, the material they gave him, what a disappointment. This thing looks like shit. So I wouldn't be surprised if it got worse numbers than pivoting, too, because there was no marketing employee for it either. So, um, yeah, this is a mess. <laughs> this is this is the worst schedule. This is, in my opinion, the worst schedule uh, for the winter and the spring here, just because of the fact that Call Me Cat is part of it. Like, you could put this with the best show on TV, and it would still be the worst, because Call Me Cat sucks that much ass, dude. Um, <laughs> Masters of Junior is fine, but there is no synergy here. Like, what fucking person <laughs> is expecting MasterChef Junior to pair well with Call Me Cat and then this Sean William Scott show? People that watch Master of Junior, I mean, they, young kids, right, watch Master of Junior. It's for them, right? It's, it's, it's you know, targeted for, like, tweens and stuff. Who the fuck is assuming that they're going to want to stick around for Welcome to Flatch featuring an actor that's fallen off the face of the earth before they were even born? Come on. Fox. Give me a break here. This is ridiculous. So moving on from that, we have, of course, NBC here. Finally, after much anticipation, we finally get the premiere of the OG Law & Order coming back for season 21. This launched last week. Um, it's actually set to have its second episode, the damn recording this on Thursday, which is going to be very exciting. Now, as far as NBC is concerned, this show did just fine. No problem in the ratings. It, it did very well. It actually was the best of the entire night for NBC. It, it outperformed SVU and Organized Crime, which was not a surprise. As far as what people's expectations were, on the other hand, this thing was a bit disappointing. I'm not going to lie. People were expecting this to do 1.0, 1.2 in the demo, and like 7 million, you know, viewership-wise. It only ended up getting about 0.75 just under that for the demo, which is still very good. That is still, like, very, very solid. That's putting it up there with Young Sheldon and, um, you know, the FBI's and um, the Chicago's, right? They're all hitting around that 0.7 mark right now, which is absolutely phenomenal. And then uh, viewership, it was around 5.75, so slightly under where people's expectations were. But that being said, like I said, NBC, definitely happy with this. Um... If they decide to renew it for season 22, this would be a great, great schedule for them to have on the fall between the Law and & Orders and the Chicago's, right, would be awesome. One thing that is helping that argument that they will continue this with season 22 next year is the major, major deal that Dick Wolf struck with NBC Universal back in 2019. They had a five-year deal set with them worth 
nine figures, which is just absolutely insane. But it makes sense considering how good these shows do for NBC. And I was checking on the forums the other day. A lot of people are saying that NBC really isn't that strong of a network outside of what they have for Dick Wolf, but they do have that contract in place at least till 2024, so at least a couple more years, and they are going to just absolutely dominate with the Law & Order shows and the Chicago shows like we talked about earlier until that contract expires, right? Whatever he's got going on with CBS and the FBI shows still, you know, those are going to do fine as well, but um, the Chicago's are really where it's at, and the Law & Order's are doing awesome as well. Um, they did slip a little bit comparable to Grey's Anatomy, like we said earlier. Grey's Anatomy was able to bounce back from where it was earlier in the season and actually premiere above of SVU, again in that direct time slot. But even so, on their own terms, all of these networks should be happy with what they got on their Thursday night premieres, except for Fox. Fox should be disappointed. Fox should be ashamed of themselves because Call Me Fucking Cat is still on there. All right. <laughs> We've been going for quite some time now, so let's quickly wrap this up here. As always, with the Friday and Saturday, we just kind of blow through these. Um, so let's do these real quick. ABC sticking with Shark Tank 2020. No problem there. Shark Tank, absolutely phenomenal show. Um, one of my favorites personally as well. But um, yeah, the Friday lineups are, they've been interesting this year because a lot of people think for a long time that Friday was the dead zone. We're seeing a bit of a revival on Friday nights. And part of that is due to CBS here with their um, dramas they have. They're sticking with Undercover Boss, which is absolutely great um, as well for them. And then Magnum P.I. and Blue Bloods, they're holding steady at 10. Blue Bloods is, as far as, like, the overall arc of all these shows, like, when we see the year-end ranks, I mean, that's definitely a top 15 to top 10 uh, contender there. I mean, Blue Bloods has been on, again, since 2010. This is its 12th season on TV, and it's still pulling in huge ratings, even if... It's on a Friday night 10 o'clock schedule, which is like the worst time to be on because you see none of the other networks even want to compete against that. Um, 2020 Dateline, you know, those are cheap to make. And then, of course, Fox and, and CBS don't, or uh, uh, CW rather don't even have their 10 o'clock schedule. So CBS is the only one taking advantage of this time slot. And they have been monopolizing this with Blue Bloods for the past decade now. And that ring is still continuing there. So they're going to do just fine. They're bringing a new show onto the schedule in spring called Come Dance With Me. From what I gather, it's another dancing competition, like So You Think You Can Dance, we talked about earlier. Don't know how well that's going to do with the CBS crowd. That's definitely seems like filler to me. Um, it's not going to have that much time to employ itself onto the schedule because spring only lasts, you know, a month and a half in TV world. So it's going to be a very short window to uh, make an impact here, so I'm not really sure what they're thinking, but at least Magnum PI and then definitely Blue Bloods are going to hold steady for the rest of the year. Um, the CW, they pulled Nancy Drew, you can see there, they replaced it with reruns of Who's Line, and then uh, Penn and Teller to, to uh, continue here for the winter. Um, this hasn't really changed much since we saw last time, because Charmed and Dynasty haven't aired yet, so um, they're just going to do what they do. Poor Dynasty, of course, one of the most infamous shows on TV, and the fact that it's always at the bottom of the ranks, and yet somehow it always gets a renewal. So it's just crazy how that works. Um, Fox here. Fox actually finding some big, big success with Friday Night SmackDown here. Um, so I'm not a wrestling guy. I'm not a sports guy, right, as many of you guys know. But holy shit, dude. As far as the TV landscape is concerned, I would put money on wrestling over any other sport, even shit like football, because football is pretty fickle when you think about it. Like, if it's not really a good matchup or if people don't like the teams, like the Super Bowl ratings, for example, last year, um, they were they were not very good. <laughs> you know, the Super Bowl, it was like the first time when the Super Bowl hit under 100 million viewers total, which is really bad for the Super Bowl. Um, this year, it was around 115 million because a lot of people really like that matchup. It was the Rams and the Bengals, and that was a really exciting game. And then they had the, the great halftime show as well with all those West Coast rappers. So football in like the general season is usually the most fickle as far as all the sports goes because 
a lot of time it just depends on what teams are playing, you know. And some people don't like um, to support teams that aren't theirs, or you know, if it's if it's a, a couple of teams that just don't really have many interesting players, then people are not going to tune in, you know. So those things can vary. Um, this year they just happen to have some really exciting ones again for those AFC and NFC championships, and then as a result of that, they um, had some good, you know, bounce. Um, some good retention, rather, for the shows that they were premiering afterwards. And then um, that helped them out a little bit, as we've been talking about, and then again for the Super Bowl there. But anyways, uh, all this is to illustrate that of all sports on TV, wrestling and the WWE seems to be the most consistent, usually, and the only channel that really benefits from it as far as um, you know, network TV is Fox because they've had this lineup for a while now with um, SmackDown on Fridays, and it's been doing very, very well for them. And again, like SmackDown, you know, or wrestling in general, not really my cup of tea, but you have stuff like AEW wrestling as well on, um, is it TNT, I believe, or TBS, <laughs> one of those. Um, it's always on cable, but like those things pull in numbers, man. People love love the WWE and, and AEW and stuff like that. Um, it was huge back in the day with like my network TV would play um, like SmackDown and Raw and stuff. Um, and I remember as a kid, those were just always on and people loved wrestling back then. But even in the decade or so since the um, the prime of wrestling when it was on network TV, um, Fox is holding steady with this. And this has been very, very consistent with them all this year so far. So shout out to Fox, man. That's, that's really cool that they can still have that niche audience. Because again, it's not my thing, but I know a lot of people, um, my close buddy Mike, of course, from Mike's Talks and Thoughts, he talks about wrestling sometimes on his channel and... Um, he doesn't watch it as much as he used to, but always really cool to see um, something in, you know, one of those more niche categories do very well on TV. So shout out to Fox there. And then finally with NBC there, um, the only real uh, big news to mention here is the Blacklist is finally coming back on Fridays there. It was a bit of a mess on Thursdays here. We can scroll back up for a minute. Um, they had it on the fall schedule uh, replacing... Uh, what was a, an originally supposed to be Law and Order for the Defense. That got pulled. They put the blacklist in there. They originally were doing hour and a half special victims unit or two hours f special victims unit. Then it got to reruns of special victims unit. And that was actually doing better than the blacklist because SVU is just a more popular show. And then finally, when the original Law and Order returned to TV at the Thursday 8 o'clock schedule, they brought the Blacklist back to Fridays there. Now, the Blacklist, as I mentioned earlier, is not really for me either. It's another just very general sort of steady uh, crime drama. But it is getting another season after this. That'll be season 10. Um, despite how kind of lukewarm and kind of, you know, just whatever the ratings have been this year, the Netflix deals with the Blacklist are some of the biggest that NBC has because of the amount of episodes they have. Like, we've talked about a billion times on this show that, you know, syndication, you have to hit five seasons or 100 episodes is usually a quota. So when it gets to that four or five season rank, you know, whenever you're, de um, you know, deciding to renew for fifth season specifically, they usually want to give it over the edge, right? That's what we're seeing with The Good Doctor, A Million Little Things, The Rookie, right? We've been talking about that all throughout this um, this TV season here. The Blacklist has now doubled that. It's gotten to its 10th season. So the amount of episodes they have, Netflix can, um, you know, they're, they're going to pay more, obviously, to get all the episodes from NBC. So that's obviously a lot more lucrative in that case. And as long as those deals hold steady and people are watching on streaming, Net, uh, NBC can just keep reviving the show and keep um, renewing the show year after year after year after year and just pumping out, you know, 22, 24 episode long seasons because Netflix is going to pay up. You know, Netflix is definitely going to pay. And it's one of those examples where it's just like the amount of time it's been on TV. So is so grand and so huge that even if it's only getting a couple million on live viewers, like the Netflix deal behind them is just is just single handedly keeping the show alive, despite how bad um, it's gotten over the years. Uh, some critically uh, critical reviews as well would argue that that the later seasons are just not very good. Um, but Netflix, you know, streaming like Netflix and then network TV like all these channels could not exist without one another. 
Like Netflix benefits so heavily from having archived and syndicated content like shows like The Blacklist for one, but just many others as well. And then NBC and ABC and all these couldn't survive really without those syndication deals and without the, the safety net of platforms like Netflix to put their content later on once it's done their run on live TV, right? So um, it's a really interesting ecosystem because people don't really give network TV a lot of credit nowadays, but it is very important in putting a show on there, you know, uh, keeping a show alive for this long because they are the proprietors of it. They own all of the licenses and stuff, and you really wouldn't be able to get all of those great sitcoms or all those legacy shows without them. So, um, you know, they, they have to work together in that regard. So very interesting to see. And finally, real quick, we'll go over Saturday here. Um, ABC basketball season starting up. So they're going to cover the uh, NBA, uh, NBA lineup there, which will be exciting. Um, for CBS, they have Super Racing Experience, Superstar Racing Experience, which I'm actually not sure what this is. Let's take a look real quick. Is this like some NASCAR? Yeah, oh, stock racing. Stock car racing. All right. So I don't really know what that is, but it's set to premiere in June, which is weird. So that's more of the summer, but um, they're just doing reruns of their, um, you know, crime dramas, their police procedurals always in the 48 hours. Um, really the only company or the only company, the only channel that um, is really taking advantage of the Saturday lineup is the CW. They're putting on their big, big hits like uh, Whose Line Is In Anyway There and Masters of Illusion is going to come back, World's Funniest Animals. They picked up this Canadian show called Great Chocolate Showdown. I was reading about this the other day. Um, this is another one of those shows that started off in 2020 that um, was picked up through the U.S. because of COVID, and they just needed stuff to fill in the schedule for. Um, you can see there it premiered on February 2020, so right before the pandemic hit. Um, but yeah, this is kind of an interesting one. Um, like I don't, I don't think you have to go seek it out if you're not a, um, you know, a cooking show kind of guy. But um, Anna Olson is actually one of the judges on the show and is kind of the host of the show. And um, she did a uh, show on Food Network Canada for a long time, which was just a, a standard, you know, stand and stir show um, that was syndicated here in the U.S. on Ion Life, which is kind of a you know digital. Um, it's, a, it's an offshoot of, of Ion TV, which is just a syndicated channel here in the U.S. And um, I used to watch her show a lot. So that was cool to see um, that she was one of the judges on here. But again, that's all just kind of trivial because I don't think most people know of that, you know, more or less. So um, but that was kind of interesting to see the CW pick it up. Uh, Fox, they had some reruns of 911 and the Cleaning Lady before. They're just going to focus on sports. And with NBC there, of course, they were doing the Olympics full-time on Saturdays because they had nothing else to do throughout the winter. And for now, they're just doing reruns, and um, we'll just have to see what they decide to put in that 8 o'clock slot going forward. But that is it, my friends, uh, for this episode of the Primetime Podcast. As always, I appreciate you guys so, so much for sticking through this one and listening through it. Um, I know I like to get a little um, kind of you know, wild on the, these and get on my soapbox every now and again, but I do appreciate you sticking through it. Um, I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts as always in the comments if you have anything to say. With that, we will see you next time on the podcast. Stay safe, everyone. Have a good rest of your day.